Hello, welcome to Ebionite Revival. Today we'll be talking about whether Semitic characteristics are perceptible in the Korean language. Here I have a picture of two roof tiles that were excavated near the Dedong River Basin. This is in the area near Pyongyang, which is in North Korea. I will be talking more about those later in more detail. There are many Korean words that resemble or appear to have some meaningful link to the vocabulary of Akkadian, Ge'ez, Tigrinya, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Tamil in particular. All those languages except for Tamil are classified as Semitic languages or Afro-Asiatic or alternatively uh, Hamito-Semitic languages. With the hope of piquing your interest, I will present some examples now in order to present the topic of my uh, presentation. This is the word Gunnu, which is from Assyrian, and some people call it Akkadian. There could be a slight difference between the two, but in most respects they're related. This word means elite troops. There is a Korean word, gundan. The basic root is gun, which means army, army corps or military. There's a related word, gunde, and that means troops, armed forces, an army. The military, basically the same meaning. And as you can see in Aramaic, there's a word gunda, which means a troop of soldiers. And in Japanese, there's a word gundan, same word basically as Korean. This is from Eidelberg's uh, book, The Biblical Hebrew Origin of the Japanese People. Abiktu, this is a word that means decisive defeat in Akkadian again. And this could mean massacre or carnage. And there's a Korean word that sounds related to it. And this means overwhelm, overpower, overcome, crush. So these are words having similar meaning and also similar sound. In the case of abdo, it sounds like it's a sort of a contraction of the original word from which it is derived. I see many examples of that sort of thing, where the Korean word is slightly shorter from the word from which it is apparently derived. Another word is giru. This is an Akkadian or Assyrian word meaning road or path or it could mean journey. In Korean there's a word gil which means a road or a way, a street, thoroughfare, basically the same meaning. And as I said the Korean word seems to be a shortened or contracted form of that word giru. Next we have a word kabot, which means armor in Korean. Uh, and a related word kapju, which means helmet or armor. And in Eidelberg's book, we have um, mention of this word Kubita, which in Syriac means a cap or hood. And in Japanese, we have a word kabuto, which means a helmet or headpiece. So Joseph, so Joseph Eidelberg was fluent in seven different languages. So you can see all these languages have cognates that appear explainable, um, in terms of their differences.
So due to idiosyncrasies in the languages, um, we can see how they could have morphed uh, from one form to another. But uh, they, uh, they're not morphed beyond recognition. Next we have this word kamadu, which means to weave and prepare cloth in a specific way. In Korean, there's a word kamta. The basic root of that word is kam because da just indicates that it's a verb. The basic root would be kam. And this means to wind, coil, twine, or roll something round another thing or reel. So we can see that in both cases, they are related to manufacture of fabric or thread or rope. So again, this Korean word seems to be a sort of shorter or abbreviated version of the word from which it is apparently derived. Next, we have this word, kamchuda. So the basic root, again, would be that part without the da, the first two syllables, kamchu. This means to conceal, to hide, to cover, veil, disguise, etc. And we can compare that to this Aramaic word on the right, which means kame, which is kamein, and it, mean, it means to hide, to conceal, to cover, etc. And and in Japanese, there's a word kamein, which means to mask or disguise, or I'm sorry, a mask or a disguise. So we can see that in all three of these languages. They have probable cognates. Next we have this word mal, which means language or speech. In Hebrew, there's a word lemaleil, which means utter, say, speak, or talk. All these verbs begin with the lamet, so we can kind of ignore that. And just look at the last three letters, malayal. And these two words, mal in Korean and le malayal in Hebrew, they mean basically the same thing, but the Korean is apparently shorter. Now we're going to look at words having to do with the concept behind the word road or way. This list here is from a work called um, A Complete Etymological Etymology Based Hundred Word List of Semitic Updated. And this is a list of 100 words as they are in dozens of Semitic languages, including Akkadian Hebrew, Gaze, um, several Arabic languages, um, Ugaritic, um, Amharic, and etc. So let's look at this Korean word, Tero. Tero means a way, a road, a highway, a thoroughfare. And look what it is in Hebrew. Look at the circled box there. Hebrew, it it's Derek. So when we a ask for directions, I think this word is actually derived from this Hebrew word, Derek. And what I noticed it, is that in many cases the English references don't list Hebrew as the etymological root 
of common words that we use, but I think often often they are. So let's look at look at the word uh, pelago, for instance. So um, we have the word archipelago, but in Hebrew, palag means to divide. So what is an archipelago? It's a group of islands divided by bodies of water or a body of water. And uh, so the relationship is fairly obvious, right? So, but yet, if you look up the word archipelago in a reference book, they won't list palag as the probable etymological root, which it probably is just based on reasoning. So we have gil as well as tero. I mentioned gil before that it's related to this word kiru. Right, so we have two words from in Korean that are related to words in two different Semitic languages. That's pretty amazing, I think, and I don't think this happened by chance. So the next example is a sort of humorous example. It has to do with poo. In ancient Hebrew, there's a word sa, which means to excrete excrement which basically means to poo or to take a crap and actually that's kind of the way it's used in korean when we say dong sada in korean sa this means to excrete feces or excrement these are words having identical meaning identical use and having only a very slight difference in pronunciation. In Korean, they apparently stopped using this TS sound several centuries ago. But if you look at the 16th, sorry, the 15th century alphabet King Sejong invented, you can see a letter that is that that represents sounds um, similar or probably uh, the same as this TS sound that is represented by the letter Tzade in Hebrew and uh, another letter in Sabian uh, languages. Uh, now we have this word knife which in Korean is kal. And I believe this word is related to two Hebrew words. One, karath, and that refers to cutting or making a covenant. Because when you made a covenant, you cut animals apart as a way of uh, reminding yourself that this is what's going to happen to you when you break the covenant. And there's another word, kara, which means tear and, or cut. So this, you can see that uh, knife is obviously related to the act of cutting. So um, in Hebrew, they often use concrete objects as metaphors for abstract things. In Korean, you you see that's. Uh, you see that there's a kind of similar dynamic going on in Korea, where you see, where you have objects described by things that, uh, actions that they do. Um, so now we're going to look at negators, negating words, several different negating words. We have the word ma, which means don't, basically. Uh, if we say haji ma, then that means don't do that. And in Semitic uh, words, we have um, we have a word that sounds similar to that ma, right? Several Semitic languages, like uh, Quranic, Arabic, Lebanese, and uh, Meccan Arabic. 
Um, and we have another negator, an, which also means not. And in several Semitic languages, again, we have um, similar cognates. In Akkadian, Hebrew, Afrasian. So this, this seems to be defying the laws of probability where two negating words are related to two Semitic, two or more Semitic um, um, words or cognates in multiple Semitic languages. So this is the this is similar to what we saw with uh, words having to do with uh, way or road, right? We we found two Korean words having relationships with to two or more Semitic languages. So now we have this word uh, that is related to beauty in Gaius or have. Uh, Gai, So I'm not sure if that's exactly the pronunciation, but you can see there are many Semitic uh, words relate uh, similar to that Gia's word, and in Korean we have the word Kain, which is related to beauty. So if we say a uh, Gain means a beautiful woman. Uh, there's a name of a Korean kingdom called Gaya. Gaya, which was a kingdom known for its iron production and metallurgy. So uh, I think this might be related to the, these Semitic roots. So what is what was beauty, what was considered beautiful in the ancient world? I think it was having a kind of copper-toned skin healthy looking skin so you can see the relationship there some skeptics might claim that Korean is too far removed geographically historically and culturally from cultures that have used Semitic languages so if you look at this map you can see that a lot of the Semitic cultures are concentrated in the Arabian Peninsula Palestine and in the Horn of Africa So let's look at um, these Afro Afroasiatic languages. Um, we have Tigray, Tigrinya, Giz, especially. Amharic is a new one. It's a 12th century language that was invented by people of Aksum for military use as a kind of code language for the slaves that were serving in the military. Uh, Amhara actually means a free man. So they gained their freedom after military service and were given land. So this is why the na name of the language is called Amharic. So Tig Tigray is uh, basically successor kingdom of Aksum and Aksum in turn was the successor kingdom of Sheba Sheba was also known as Saba and Saba and Sheba are both mentioned in uh, in the Bible um, if you've read uh, the Bible then you know that the queen of Sheba was someone who visited King Solomon whom she had greatly admired for his wisdom and I went with a list of questions to test his wisdom and she was marveled by her wisdom and uh, she, and when she returned she was given many gifts including gifts she couldn't even imagine but uh, I'll let you find out what those sorts of gifts were but we'll talk about more later but in the ancient world there were these trade routes which allowed a lot of interaction between cultures that were very distant so you can see that Africa was connected to Asia and Arabia and even the Mediterranean 
and uh, they were also actually going to Korea, as I understand. And they used monsoon winds to travel these sea routes. And Sheba became very wealthy through this trade because they controlled the trade in frankincense, myrrh, bitumen, spices, and other goods. The land of Southern Arabia and the Horn of Africa, this was the land of Sheba. Now it's Yemen and Ethiopia. And also in India, they had a lot of uh, port cities and a lot of trade there too. So they had a lot of cultural links to, to uh, Sheba. And the Persian prophet, uh, so Persian sage Mani, uh, said that there, the four most important empires in the world were China, Rome, Greece, and Aksum. But among them, Aksum had the greatest ideological and religious influence. So you can see that historically speaking, there is reason to believe that there could have been a possibility that many of these cultures very distant from Aksum could have inherited uh, words or ideas that from Aksum or Sheba. And uh, that's a more current map that shows shipping lanes in the turn of the 20th century. One of the world's most accomplished scholars on the lost tribes of Israel, Professor Avigdor Shachan, found that from the period not long after the Assyrians took many of the members of, of the tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel, Captive in the 8th century BCE, there were migrations of some of the ten northern tribes constituting the kingdom of Israel towards Korea. He wrote a book, In the Footsteps of the, ten, of the Lost Ten Tribes. Here are some of Professor Shachan's findings. As biblical testimony supports, the Assyrians took the north the northern tribes constituting the kingdom of Israel captive after conquering it in the latter part of the 8th century BCE. These tribes were placed towards the eastern border of, As of Assyria to serve as a buffer against enemies. They apparently didn't like that, thus the tribes decided to go elsewhere, so they took refuge in present-day Afghanistan. Some place names in Afghanistan still present to this day exhibit their Hebraic etymology. For example, the name Hazara means foreign land. And the, the na name uh, Kandahar means this is the mountain. There are some cultural and religious vestiges of Hebraic and ancient Jewish culture still remaining in Afghanistan. For example, many Jewish symbols, surnames, and customs such as kosher diet, lighting candles every Friday night, and hiding it in a basket, and wearing of amulets, having Shema Israel, which is which is uh, the Lord our God is one, right? Which is the foundational mono monotheistic creed of Sinaitic religion. Since outsiders remained skeptical whether they had converted to Islam, they compensated by acting like more extreme Muslims. This is what Shachan found. Eventually, the Levite priests divided, devised a plan to return one day to the land of Canaan after living for a prolonged time in exile. They decided to migrate towards the easternmost reaches of the continent, namely towards Korea and Japan. Some took the route through the Gobi Desert, which is in present-day Mongolia. And as you can imagine, 
40% approximately died during that journey. I'm not sure whether Shahan's methodology is fully reliable, but this is his opinion. Some others took a route through China, and most of them survived. Uh, or, well, more of them survived than than uh, those who went through the Gobi Desert, and uh, sixty percent survived while going going through the Gobi Desert, and uh, more some more than that survived. Those who failed to make it to Korea felt guilt, and thus named themselves. Khatai, Khatai, which means my sins. Incidentally, the Russian still referred to Russia as Kitai and to the Chinese as Kitaisky. In China, there were Jewish communities set up in places such as Kaifeng. Uh, roughly 50,000 settled in Kaifeng, China, and built a temple. But the temple was destroyed by a big flood. This temple was constructed based on the model in uh, in the in in the Holy Lands. Here's an example of a Chinese family uh, in 1910, Chinese Israelite family in Kaifeng. And on the right there is an example of uh, some some of the Jews, exiled Jews, reading from the Torah. So I mentioned these roof tiles that were excavated near the Daedong River Valley in Pyongyang. And they are part of the Iuchi Sao collection in the National Museum of Korea. There are Hebrew writings on these roof tiles. And one of them, it says, the judge governs with the proverb. Another, on the other side, it says, the the heaven will will be re recovered by saints' prayers. And uh, there's another roof tile on which it says, enter the kingdom of God in cooperation with the five-petaled flower. Now, what is this five-petaled flower? I believe it is the Rose of Sharon, because the Rose of Sharon is the national flower of Korea. It's called Mugunghwa. And interestingly, the Rose of Sharon is mentioned two times in the Bible, and it's actually a symbol of the Messiah. <laughs> so this is a very messianic message, actually. Uh, found in a roof tile, uh, and it's found in Korea, in the in a place uh, most people would not expect Hebrew to be found. But this is exactly the sort of thing one would expect if if some of the children of Israel had migrated there. So there's a man named Joseph Eidelberg, and he wrote a book called. The Biblical Hebrew Origin of the Japanese People. And in this book, he has a comparison between Japanese and Hebrew characters. Some of these uh, letters are actually uh, the characters plus their vowels added. But when you do that, all these characters look very similar if not identical. There's another book called The Japanese and the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. Eidel also, Eidelberg also found similarities in many customs between Shinto and ancient Jewish religious practices. For example, there are most holy places in Shinto shrines called Honden, where only the high priest of the Nakatomi clan 
which is said to have descended from the heavenly priest named Koyane, is allowed to enter. The name Koyane is probably related to the name Kohen, and actually they're even spelled in a similar way uh, when you look at the letters uh, spelling Koyane and Kohen. Upon examining the sacred official Japanese history referred to as Nihongi or Nihon Shoki, which means Japanese chronicles or chronicles of Japan. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't remember to put that in there in the quotation marks. Eidelberg found some of the events related to early Japanese emperors are almost identical with the events that took place during the reign of ancient Hebrew kings. That's a quote. Here's another quote. The wars of the ancient Japanese with the Yabisu and Edomi tribes are similar to some of the wars of the ancient Hebrews with the Yabusites and Edomites. So in Hebrew, that's pronounced Yabusites. Yevisu. Um, sorry, Yevusi and um, and Edom. So you can see how they're related, especially if you take into account the idiosyncrasies of Japanese language. He also said many details in the Japanese story of an exodus and journey to settle in the land of the reed metals are very similar to events described yeah yeah another example of a japanese tradition which is also mentioned in the bible is a tradition of dedicating horses to the sun and the uh, god to whom these horses were dedicated is named amaterasu now, my friend from Tigray told me that this uh, name, Amate, that the first part of that name, Amate, is, means that it is a christened name. What follows is a christened name. So many women have such names. Actually, many Tigrayan women have two names, one the priest gave them and the one their parents gave them. In the old times, they... they give many Tigrayan women in the old times didn't give uh, give the names to their children uh, parents didn't give their names to their children they only the priests did that sort of thing but nowadays they've adopted Ethiopian customs and now uh, they do give the names to their children but the second part of the name Rasu means head so so this person was christened as head now this is interesting because in the bible the sun is is ordained to govern the day while the moon is appointed to govern the night right so so if you're saying someone was christened as head then uh, it is this kind of similar concept but it seems that those involved in sun worship took it a bit too far. You know, they didn't recognize that these uh, celestial bodies were just appointed governors and not gods. But isn't that interesting that in Japan they continued with this sun worship even after they were exiled. So they didn't learn the lesson from the exile. There's another example. There's something called yasaka, which is a particular bead in the shape of a kama. And it's used by the ancient Japanese as an amulet. But if you're familiar with Hebrew, when you see this, you can see the letter yod, which has a Y sound. Often in Hebrew, the letter yod represents Adonai. 
So this word yasaka, if you broke this down, you would see yah, which means Adonai, and saka, which means look. So look to Adonai, because in Hebrew the verb follows the noun often. But the letter yod has a lot of spiritual meaning, and in this website Hebrew for Christians, it explains many of those meanings. Suspended in midair, yod is the smallest of the Hebrew letters, the atom of the consonants, and the form from which all the other letters begin and end. So yod is the most basic part of all other letters. In the Jewish mystical tradition, Yod represents a mere dot, a divine point of energy. Since Yod is used to form all the other letters, and since God used the letters as the building blocks of creation, Yod indicates God's omnipresence. In fact, the word Yod itself depicts something of the geometry of creation. It begins the yod itself as a dot and then moves downward from the divine toward the created order to form vav, the hook of creation. Finally, it moves outward in the horizontal realm as dalet, the doorway of creation. This can better be seen with the following illustration. Yeah, so we have uh, dalet and vav. Yod is also related to humility. The letter Yod being the smallest of the letters is also a picture of humility. For example, when Yaakov was renamed from Yaakov to Yisrael, all that remained of his former name was letter Yod. Yod can also be seen as a mark of humility in the text that says Moses was the most humble man upon the face of the earth. So this is one of those very rare occurrences where you find a yod nested under another yod. The Jewish scribes say that an extra yod is inserted in the word ana, meaning humble or meek, to emphasize the humility of Moses. Uh, Israel is likewise called the uh, smallest of the nations, and it, and it is considered a type of yod before the great nations of the earth. That's very interesting because Yeshua has a lot to say about the humble and meek inheriting the earth in the Sermon on the Mount. Yod is also related to spirituality. So Yod means arm or hand and its form suggests a hand is reaching towards heaven. In addition, the letter somewhat resembles a man in prayer. Here the tag suggests a crown that is given to the one who is humbled before the Lord in prayer, and the bent shape suggests submission. So you can see again it, the the crown is related to both the Yod and this uh, this uh, symbol of the Shilla dynasty, the Shilla dynasty crown. Uh, the meaning of Yod is also related to number 10. Um, I'm not going to read all those examples. Uh, Yod is also related to the divine name. Yod is the first letter of the divine name, which is represented by the te tetragrammaton Yod He Vav He, represented as Y H V H, and the name of the Savior of the world, Yeshua thus indicating its preeminence. It is also the first letter for four names given to the Jewish people. Um, not just four names, but these four names. Um, this this name, Yeshurun, is just a, is another way of referring to the chosen people. Yeshurun. As the first letter of Adonai's name, Yod shows that he is spirit, he is one, and that from him derive all other things by the power of his word. So again, Yod is elemental to the Hebrew language. It's interesting because there's a lady from Tamil I, I was talking with on YouTube 
on a YouTube video. And her name is Nalini Prasanna. Tamil is on the southern tip of India. And uh, and Tamil has a very important Christian history because Thomas um, evangelized Kerala and Tamil Nadu. So she says, the crown is in the shape of a traditional lamp. She's referring to the Shila dynasty crown with tridents one over the other with a symbol of cross made with pure gold. It reveals that he was crucified and yet he conquered. The traditional lamp has a profound meaning. The base depicts the footstool or the earth and the, the lamp, lamp head depicts his crown. It has to be studied because the entire universe is embodied in that lamp. So she believes this is uh, definitely a Judaic crown. I noticed that most of the scholars think this is influenced by shamanism and it symbolizes shamanic, shamanistic concepts, but I don't agree because I don't think a lot of these scholars listen to different opinions. There are other, I think, other influences. I think are Judaic uh, found in Korea, Korean artifacts. For example, there is something called a shila dagger, and this is this is valued at one trillion dollars. And I think this is actually uh, an heirloom that was passed down through the Sikari. The Sikari were a group of uh, assassins that were uh, targeting, um, for example, collaborators of Rome. And you can see they carried daggers very similar to the one found in Korea. Now, in the one found in Korea is, is found in a tomb that was excavated, I think it was in the 6th century common era. But it's interesting because there were two men buried together, uh, and it's not very common to see that uh, two men buried side by side, but I think it's because um, these these were the last of the Sikari that in Korea, and I think these men were were um, the last of the Sikari, and they inherited this dagger from their ancestors who were also Sikari. Uh, but nobody actually makes this sort of analysis, although some of the patterns on the dagger uh, can be explained. Nalini also mentioned that this woman named Ha Huangok, uh, who is the Indian princess who married this man named Kim Suro, who was the leader of the Kaya dynasty, Kaya, sorry, the Kaya Confederacy. Um, and uh, this union was arranged by Thomas, the disciple of Yeshua. Uh, I think the Tamils generally know this information, but not a lot of the Koreans do. Nalini says that uh, Ha Huangok was the youngest sister among the four sisters and seven siblings of Yeshua the Christ. And then she was married in 48 AD to the chief of the Surah clan. That date is um, agreed also in the Korean annals. Now the Surah clan was a clan of shark hunters. Now uh, why were they hunting sharks? because the sharks got in the way. They were obstacles during warfare. They also endangered the divers who were um, diving in the oceans to uh, search for saleable goods, such as pearls and seaweed and whatnot. But uh, they were married in the Kanyakumari district before sailing together to Korea. Now, in the... Korean dramas, they they show that they were married in Korea. Now maybe there was a second wedding ceremony there, but uh, but in in the uh, Tamil histories, they were married in Kanyakumari district, 
And that kind of makes sense because uh, I think if they, if the, if she really was whom the Tamil believes she was, the the sister of Yeshua, um, the Galileans uh, had a custom where the groom always goes to fetch the bride, and she does that during he does that during the middle of the night. And only the father knows the date and the time of the wedding. So uh, they come with a lot of people and uh, make loud loud noises. And uh, um, and the whole village uh, comes to the wedding. Um, so she so the so the the woman is taken in a in a carrying device uh, 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 a vessel and is hoisted above the ground and taken to the wedding in the middle of the night. Now it's interesting also um, this uh, this place called uh, the Eye Kingdom was renamed to a name Tiruvita Kode. Now, both this uh, this name, this name, and the name. Um, I'm sorry. The word, the word pen, peninsula. She told me, is actually derived uh, from a Tamil expression meaning meaning uh, woman's womb, because peninsula means. Or peninsula, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It actually means woman's womb. So in so you have a definite uh, connection to Miriam, the mother of both Yeshua and Ho uh, Huangok. So so they left behind this evidence that the Virgin Mary moved to that region. Now they were probably hiding from the Romans who were trying to wipe them out. Now it's a fact that that uh, that the 1992 Barcelona Olympic men's marathon winner was the son of one of these women divers. Uh, these women divers, uh, they're common in both Korea and and uh, in Tamil Nadu. They still have them to this day, this, this culture of women divers. Now, why, do, why were the Sura clan in Korea, what well, was he doing in Korea if he's the chief of the Sura clan? And uh, Prasanna Nalini Prasanna explained to me that they occupied many, many of the peninsular areas of the world, so that they could uh, play. They could avoid. They could avoid uh, the enemies that were trying to pursue them, uh, especially if the island had a. a if the peninsula had an island or a large group of islands uh, nearby uh, where they could play hide and seek effectively. So now we'll talk about uh, the question, besides Hebrew, what other Semitic languages might have influenced Korean? To answer this question, I feel it could be useful to reflect on the work and findings of Professor Avigdor Shachan. Based on research on the Beta Israel, pejoratively called the Falasha, which means landless, not all the northern tribes were taken captive into Assyria. Some managed to flee to the lands near the lower Nile region, which we refer to as Ethiopia. This is Stephen Kaplan. 
He's a professor of African studies and comparative religion at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So he's a top scholar. He wrote a book called the Beta Israel um, or Falasha in Ethiopia from earliest times to the 20th century. On pages 24 to 25, he says the lost tribe of Dan. Uh, in 1973, the, the Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel, Ovadia Yosef, publicly declared the Beta Israel to be Jews according to Halakha. He, he, dis, he stated that they were descendants of the last, the lost tribe of Dan. In describing his lineage to Beta Israel, he invoked a tradition that in different forms can be traced back through Jewish sources for over 500, perhaps even more than a thousand years. In a later section, we shall examine some texts that discuss this tradition to see what, if any, information they contain concerning the history of the Beta Israel. For the moment, okay, um, the earliest source for a tradition connecting the Jews of Egypt with the tribe of Dan is probably the mysterious 19th, the ninth century figure, Eldad Hadani. Eldad himself claimed to be from the tribe of Dan, hence the name Hadani, which lived along with Naphtali, Gad, Asher, and the sons of Moses beyond the rivers of Cush. To this day, scholars remain uncertain about his origins and motives. While some have dismissed him as a hoax, others have viewed him as a Karaite, Arabian, or even Ethiopian Jew. So Abraham Epstein doesn't think he was Ethiopian, but um, but he was probably an Arabian Jew. So you can see that Naphtali, Gad, Asher, and along with Dan and the sons of Moses, um, they all went to the lands beyond the rivers of Cush, which is in the lower Nile area region. Why would they have gone to this region? I believe it's because uh, they would have had several escape routes via sea. In other words, they fled to the regions constituting the land of Sheba. Now there's this writing on Sheba, and they became very wealthy through trade, as I mentioned. Uh, they built a dam there, and uh, yeah, so they traded in frankincense, uh, especially. They migrated to the lands of Sheba probably because Sheba had already become converted to Judaism as a result of the union between King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, also called Makeda, a union that resulted in the birth of a Judaic king named King Menelik. There's a mural that depicts the uh, the union and uh, Menelik visited King Solomon when he became an adult. According to some versions of the Kabra Nagast, upon Menelik's return to Sheba, Solomon sent the firstborn of all the Levite priests uh, back with Menelik to Sheba. Perhaps Solomon did this while realizing that his own kingdom was then destined for decline and wanted Menelik to preserve a pure form of worship of Adonai in Sheba. If so, it would have it would seem he was justified in his decisions as Assyria and Babylon would come to him to make the people of Israel and Judah vassals and captives over the next few centuries. On the other hand, uh, Syria Syria uh, and Sheba became 
leading lights of Christianity, centers of Christianity, very influential in the Middle East and Asia and Africa. And then Syriac and uh, the um, Tawahedo Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, are actually very related, uh, very close in terms of theology and Christology in particular. They don't uh, subscribe to uh, Christological ideas that uh, Catholic Church and mo most of the West also subscribe to. And Jesus also mentions the Queen of Sheba the queen of the, uh, as the queen of the south, which I think is is a metaphor for um, Tigray, Aksum, etc. Because these country, the, the that kingdom actually uh, converted to belief in Yeshua only one year after the crucifixion. But but uh, Yeshua actually said that they will rise w along with this generation of unbelievers and they will judge it because the Queen of the South uh, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon, uh, Solomon from faraway lands. Um, but now now someone greater than Solomon is here, and he's actually referring to himself. But, but this is especially damning because the Queen of Sheba is someone from faraway lands where the people listening, whereas the people listening and seeing Yeshua, some of them didn't believe him and condemned him. But... Um, But he he is saying that uh, he's actually prophesying that uh, Sheba would come to believe in Yeshua. But a lot of the Western histories will tell you that uh, Ethiopia didn't become Christianized until the fourth century, and this is wrong information, according to uh, Tamil people. I'm sorry, according to Tigrayan people that I know. If we accept that the Kabra and the Gast and the aforementioned testimony Aldad Hadani are the most reliable, we can conclude that members of six Israelite tribes along with the descendants of Moses and probably some from the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Yosef, migrated to the regions that were called the land of Sheba during the time of Solomon and during the time of the Assyrian invasions. Okay, in terms of uh, Korean history um, and its roots to the lost tribes, again, there is a 19th century work by a researcher named N. McClude, who wrote a book titled Korea and the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. This book is archived at the website of the National Library of Australia. So he also makes these connections between the name Tangun and these uh, and the tribe of Dan, uh, which I uh, this is a connection that I also made independently before I even found this work. But uh, he th seems to think that the Gun part is is a uh, is an indication that they deified. Dangun, but I have a different opinion. I think that uh, Gun, the Gun part is actually uh, related to a Greek word which means woman. So I think actually uh, Dangun uh, represents the fact that the uh, patriarchs, the first patriarchs, the first several generations of patriarchs of Korea were had they had they had a common uh, Danite mother. So 
So McLeod is referring to the Korean founding myth around the person whose title was Dan Gun, right? This is something from ancientorigins.net, I think it is. And uh, Dangun Wangom, known as Dangun or Tangun, was the legendary founder of Go Joseon or Old Joseon, which is the first recorded state in Korean history. This was the time before the Three Kingdoms period, which started in the first century common era. Earliest accounts of Dangun appear in two 13th century manuscripts, Sangguk Yusa and uh, Jiawang Ungi. Dangun's grandfather, Huang In, was referred to as the Lord of Heaven. His father, Huang Un, was one of Huang In's younger sons. Huang Un asked his father to send him down to earth so that he could govern his own kingdom, and Huang In grants his wish. Huang Un then descended into a sacred sandalwood tree on the peak of Mount Debaksan. This story, I believe, is actually a history, but it's written in symbols, in metaphorical language. So not a lot of analysts have actually considered that possibility, strangely enough. Uh, but I think uh, when they're talking about a tiger and bear uh, giving birth to humans, then you have to ask the question whether tiger and bear are symbols for for women. I believe that they were indeed women, and the bear was probably one of Dainite descent. But before I talk about that, let's talk about this this year of Korea's r r purported founding is 2333 BC. Now, this is one year before the start of the Akkadian dyn dynasty in, in, uh, in Mesopotamia. And uh, this year was, you know, that was about the time the Sumerian, the Sumerian civilization collapsed. So this tells me there's a possibility that that there was a there was a sequence of events between the fall of Sumer and the founding of Korea. Now again, the bear and tiger of the story were made to self-isolate, in effect, uh, while eating mugwort and 20 cloves of garlic. So why mugwort and garlic? So... When I when I when I look at the natural herbs guide, we find that these both of these uh, both of these substances were folk remedies for malaria. And mugwort contains artemisinin, which is a natural malaria treatment. And artemisinin is found even in uh, drugs that combine artemisinin with uh, other uh, synthetic with synthetic substances, something called uh, proartem. So why would they be told to eat mugwort and uh, garlic? There is no malaria in Korea and probably, probably even in in 2333, there probably probably wasn't malaria then either. So why would they be told to eat this? It's probably because these women had migrated from lands where there was endemic malaria.
So I think the I think at least the bearer was a Danite woman from a region that had these sorts of conditions that uh, that would cause someone to uh, contract malaria. Our tiger and bear metaphors were two bridal candidates from foreign lands where malaria was endemic. Was the woman represented as bear, the one who ended up marrying Dango's father, a Danite? Well, here's the here's the reason I believe um, it was a Danite woman because there's a Greek word gune, which actually means woman, and so gun could be a kind of contracted form of gune because Koreans love to contract things, as you can see. And I think the uh, first few patriarchs of, of Korea were given this title in order to in order to honor their uh, the matriarch from which they were descended. So let's see what the Book of Genesis has to say about Dan, the tribe of Dan. That might give us some clues uh, to uh, Korean culture and uh, symbols especially. So Jacob, it says in Genesis 49, Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the end of days. Assemble yourselves and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel, your father. There are two things basically that are prophesied of Dan. One is that he shall judge his people and uh, the second is that he shall be a serpent in the way, um, a horned snake in the path that biteth, biteth the horse's heels, so that the rider falls back, backward. So I think this actually um, points to the fact that uh, they will be very good soldiers. So soldiers of Tigray are known for their superior discipline, astute military strategy, and courage. They still employ fighting tactics developed by a legendary 19th century figure named Ras Alula, who is called the Garibaldi of Ethiopia. Alula was from the Tempian region of Tigray, which is the region Makeda called home. That should be a D there, sorry. Makeda, Queen of Sheba. Korean soldiers are also known for their high discipline and courage. So you can see that uh, the symbol for Dan is a serpent, one of the symbols. Here's the Hebrew that uh, contains that those prophecies. <coughs> Now, in this documentary called the uh, Gaia, called the, yeah about Gaia, yeah about the Gaia Confederacy, yeah, which was known for their iron production. Yeah, this was this is a, a kingdom that was founded by Kim Suro, which I mentioned before, and his wife from from Tamil Nadu, Ha Huangok in Korean history, Sembavala and Suri Ratna in in Indian historical annals. Now, now you see these figures there. Now, uh, people are saying these are figures of ducks, but actually, they could well be pictures of snakes. 
we also have this uh, swirl pattern found in some artifacts, and I think this actually represents snakes, the coils of snakes. We have um, hair hair that is uh, styled in the shape of snakes, so I think this this could be a link to Dan as well. So I think uh, early Koreans, Koreans long ago, they were aware of these Danite roots, but over time they probably forgot their their roots. Uh. So as we discussed earlier, some of the Danites, along with some of the other tribes comprising the northern kingdom of Israel, migrated to the monarchy of Sheba, which had already become largely Jewish prior to their migration. Languages used in ancient Sheba and its successor kingdom called Aksum included Giz, Tigrinya, Hebrew, and Greek. Tigrinya is named after its origin near the Tigris River. Giz and Tigrinya have many similarities, and Giz is also believed to have originated in the lands of present-day Iraq, where there were ancient kingdoms of Sumer, Akkad, and Ur, from which Abraham hailed. Giz's and Tigrinya's common origins in Mesopotamia would explain why Giz and Akkadian share much vocabulary. If we allow the Bible to form our interpretations, we could deduce that both Giz and Tigrinya were brought to lands near the Nile, referred to as Mizraim in the Tanakh, by migrants during the great biblical famines described in Genesis. Some of these migrants apparently became conscripted laborers, and this would explain why some of the earliest evidences for Giz are found in Egyptian shrines. Some scholars have noticed that there are great similarities between Korean and Sumerian. A notable example is Moon Jung Chang, who wrote a book titled Korean Sumerian Israeli History. Here's a kind of advertisement I found on uh, the Korean equivalent of Amazon. Uh, I don't agree with this sort of deep time uh, dating of um, of of chronology because deep time uh, it imposes a kind of gradualistic bias um, so actually I think these Sumerians didn't actually uh, come from Manchuria as he claims or as he thinks but uh, rather the uh, Sumerians migrated later to to the region of Manchuria, which has historically been part of Korea through much of Korea's history. 